SBU is the Spina Bifida Association's new viral education program. Our goal is to bring the world's best care providers and resources directly into your home. SBU is the only free webinar series dedicated solely to the educational, employment, social, self-advocacy, and health needs of people with spina bifida. We hope that you will enjoy this presentation. Interventions to address math and reading challenges in spina bifida and that you take the time to complete the evaluation at the close of the presentation. All right, I'm back, and I hope to deliver all the things I promised I would deliver earlier today. Um, so I'll be talking about the intervention piece of, of things today um, to sort of dovetail with what I spoke about earlier with recognizing these learning challenges in children with spina bifida. So... My objectives by the end of this talk here to be able to explain the importance of academic intervention across the lifespan in individuals with spina bifida, should be able to describe some intervention strategies that are incorporated within different sorts of interventions that help to make those things good interventions. Um, we'll talk about some informal sorts of interventions that parents, other professionals can do with children and talk about some empirically validated reading and math interventions. Um, I want to point everyone to these two handouts that you have. There's one with reading with a young man on it and one about math with a young lady on it. And a lot of the informal interventions that I speak about today are within this as well. So I think you should have both of them. Just make sure you have copies of both. Okay. So with my talk today, there are a couple of key things that I want you to think about all the way through. This is one of them, this idea of the Matthew effect. I'm not sure if it's something that people are familiar with this terminology, but it's this idea that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And it's been shown to very much be the case in reading. And what's thought to happen is that individuals who enjoy reading read more, get more practice with it, become more fluid in it, become better readers, and then they want to read more and then become better at it and they want to read more. Whereas individuals who are poorer at reading want to read less, then they don't benefit from that extra practice, they don't get that increased vocabulary, things like that. And certainly the same sort of thing could be said about math. So in thinking about interventions, I think focusing on interventions that help to avoid the Matthew effect is going to be important. So I'll hit on that as we go through. Another thing that I want you to think of in an overarching way as we go is this idea that children, individuals with spina bifida, have great cognitive strengths and that there are wonderful interventions that can help use those strengths, build on those strengths, to help make up for, bolster their areas of weakness. So that's going to be something to look for in a good intervention. And also this developmental perspective. I think that parents, educators, everyone can very easily get off track and start thinking about, well, this eight-year-old is a great, want them to be the most successful third grader they can be. But ultimately, the reason that we have children go to school is not so that they can be a good third grader or fifth grader. It's so that they can be a competent adult within society. So keeping those long-term goals in mind and working toward them in developmentally appropriate ways across the lifespan. So I want you to keep all those things in mind as we go through. So I'm going to talk about these particular areas of, of intervention, what we know about them, looking at informal things as well as formal things. So starting very early on with this basic reading, the sort of phonics skills. Um, this will be included in that what to do handout that I pointed you to earlier. Um, helping parents understand that the, the things that we do with reading and the things that we do with math that are so important for this population are the things that they use in the environment later on as adults. So making the academics an integral part of their environment as they go. So in doing that, doing things like playing phonics games, um, looking at rhyming words, um, doing things like coming up with words that start with the same letter, um, you know, what words start with the same letter as your name. If you can find one thing at the store that starts with the letter D, you can have, you can buy that, things like that. Looking at things, pick the dog. The dog. <laughs> Can you find it at the store? <laughs> you have to be careful what you're promising. Um, <laughs> looking at things that are true across um, situations. So looking at 
morphemes, the sort of smallest bit of a word that changes its meaning. So if you add an S to the end of a word, what does it look like? So what if I say the word dog, what's more than one dog? What if I say the word hippopotamus, we don't want one of those, but you know, what, what, how can you say more than one of each of those things? Um, prefixes, suffixes, things like that. And these are things that parents can do in the car with their child when they're trying to divert a temper tantrum or to distract them from waiting a long time at the restaurant or, or whatever it is, just working these things in. So those are informal things, and you'll see that these are sort of based on what we know about interventions. Isn't he cute? <laughs> so we know that phonics-based instruction is the way to go, that if you have an intervention without phonics, it is not going to be as useful. But be sure that your phonics intervention includes text reading. You need to learn the phonics in the context of the text that you'll be reading. So good reading interventions need to include both. Um, so things that we'll hear again and again, this direct explicit instruction, you're going to hear me say a lot today because that's the way to do it. Um, you need to explicitly teach exactly what it is that you want them to learn. It kind of goes in with this domain-specific sort of intervention. And this sounds really intuitive. If you want a child to learn how to do math calculations, you have to teach them how to do that. If you want them to do multiple digit, two-digit addition subtraction, you have to explicitly teach them how to do that. It's amazing how unclear that is. So it's sort of like if you were trying to teach a person how to run a marathon and you had them practice by running the 50-yard dash, that's not training for a marathon. It, they're both running. You can see they're both similar, but you have to explicitly teach the things that you need for the, the skill you want them to be successful in. And that's very true with reading. It's very true with math. And you'll see that in some of the interventions later on as well. So we know that phonics-based instruction works. You can do it in small groups, just as effective as if you do it in individual format. And you have intervention three to five times a week. That usually works pretty well. If children don't respond to that, then you need to be, have more intensive intervention, more individualized intervention, um, more frequent intervention. Um, and that sort of gets back to the RTI model. What does not work, these are good things to know, is any programs that look towards sort of the auditory processing or visual processing of, of words in isolation, it does not work. Fast forward does not work. Um, the early method does not work. You need to teach the words that you want them to read in a phonetic way, including it in text. And going back to the non-responders, that's sort of the idea of moving from the tier one to the tier two to the tier three interventions. That more intensive, more frequent um, intervention is required once a child does not respond to a lower level intervention. So there are some very nice decoding interventions that are very well researched um, to go along with the RTI sort of model. This first one, the Peer Assisted Learning, or PALS. Um, Lynn and Doug Fuchs and their group um, came up with this intervention. It's a very nice solid tier one intervention. It includes small group instruction where the peers sort of help and mentor one another. So you put a higher achieving reader with a lower achieving reader and um, have them work together. And as you get from sort of tier one to tier two, then this reading recovery is a program that is, has been shown to be very effective. I do want to say that there are other programs that are effective. These are just exemplars and the sort of things that are included in them. So if you don't see one here, don't assume that it's a bad intervention. So moving on from the sort of tier one, and tier two type things, this is a nice intervention that's been shown to work with sort of tier two, tier three um, intervention phases and this phonological and strategy training. Now this is gonna be one of our first exemplars of um, kind of drawing in what Dr. Zabel spoke about this morning, this idea that children with spina bifida are, are quite good at the assembled processes, or sorry, the associative processes, and have a harder time when they have to do those assembled processes. So they're, they're good at remembering um, the, the skills to use when you teach them, but when they have to figure out what skills to use, then that's more difficult for them. 
So teaching the rule that it can always apply and teaching them how to apply it and practicing that with them. And this really does hit on that. So children are taught a specific sounding out strategy. Um, they're taught different word identification strategies. And they're also taught these sort of mnemonic devices to help them remember how a strategy goes. So this seeing the part of the word you know, they call this the I spy part of the intervention. And it helps children to remember that you know, there's this I spy thing and this is what it stands for and this is what I do. And then the looking for different vowel sounds and knowing that vowel sounds can sound differently depending on what other letters they're next to. And this idea of peeling off the extraneous pieces. So to get at the core word, take off the prefixes, take off the suffixes, now that word's easier to read. There's much less of it to decode your way through. As I mentioned, there are these mnemonic devices and they're very explicitly taught. Um, and this last one here is about the metacognitive side of it. And metacognitive for the folks of us who don't know that lingo um, is the idea that you're thinking about your thinking process as you're doing it. So you're taught to, you have these five strategies here that you can use to help you read. Pick one, try it out, see how it's working, at the end decide if it was effective or not, and if it wasn't, try a new strategy. You've got four others. And so children are taught specifically to go through this using this mnemonic same to remind them the different steps of that process. All right. Reading comprehension. Um, so to get back to the idea of the overarching importance of the developmental perspective in intervention, what reading comprehension really aims to do is to allow children to read in the real world. Um, so thinking about sort of what grade level you want a child to be able to read at to see if you, know, you just need them to read green eggs and ham. Or do you want them to be able to write, read Time Magazine or The New Yorker or those all important medical forms that a lot of them are going to need to read and understand? Um, so thinking in that trajectory when you're thinking about interventions for a child and not getting derailed. I know that Dr. Zabel spoke early about handwriting in this population might be particularly difficult. Um, you know, if sixth graders need to read Romeo and Juliet and the Old English. Do they really need to read that? What do you hope to get them to learn from that that contributes to this long-term goal? And really thinking about that and making plans for them. So reading comprehension. Comprehension isn't just for reading. Um, you comprehend things that you listen to as well. I think this point is very important, maybe particularly in the spina bifida population because it has been shown that listening comprehension is one of the best predictors of reading comprehension in adulthood. So there is a certain component of just comprehension that's important to reading. Um, so early on, informally reading with your child, of course, is very important. But there's nothing to say that reading means opening a book and reading it from cover to cover. Really, especially with children with spina bifida, it's really important to give the lesson that you're supposed to learn something from that text. And we can talk about what we learned from that text. And we can answer questions from what we learned from that text. And we can anticipate what happens on the next page as we read through the text and pause and stop to think about that. Because that's really what you're going to ask them to do in grade school and later on when you're asking them to do comprehension. So as you go through with a young child asking them what questions or where questions or why questions, um, asking them to draw inferences, so stopping partway through the story and saying, what do you think will happen next? Um, and then at the end, having them summarize or retell it. So maybe they tell it to you, maybe they tell it to mom or dad, maybe they tell it to their therapist when they go in to see them for whatever therapy. Um, but practicing that that's part of the story is that you read it so that you can share it. So reading comprehension interventions have some great strategies. And this is sort of an overview page. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of things on here that I think are important. This idea of explicitly teaching vocabulary has been shown to be effective, an effective component of reading intervention strategies. I think that's a particularly nice and useful thing to use in a population of children with spina bifida because they have such good vocabularies. And they're good at acquiring vocabulary and using that vocabulary. So using that to help bolster their comprehension. Um, and also these sort of metacognitive skills that we talked about a little bit already, I think are going to be important. Teaching them to sort of think about what they're reading 
if that's making sense, and what, what do I do if it's not making sense, and coming up with strategies that always work. So along those lines, if you know, before your uh, child reads something, you want to teach them that there are very important things that they should look for and look at. Um, there are sort of things about text that give you a big bang for your buck. So if you look at the title, that tells you a lot about the story. If you look at the, the topic headings, that'll tell you a lot. If there are pictures or graphs or charts with captions, that summarizes a lot of the information that's in the text. So pointing them to those things and helping them to look at those, think about those, draw inferences, or think, think about what that means and what that might mean about the story and what it's about. Um, this idea of looking at the questions at the end of the chapter before you read through it. So as you're going through, you've got that information activated in your mind about what you're looking for. So when you see it, it's easier to, to recognize it instead of getting to the end of the story and having to go back and think about where you saw that bit of knowledge and reading through. As you're reading through, um, using things like rubrics to get through and to make a assembled process more associative in nature. So if you know every time you read through, you want to know um, if what I want to pay attention to, is this making sense to me? If it's not making sense to me, I need a strategy that will work. So first I'm going to reread it. If it doesn't make sense, I'm going to ask for help. Um, and letting children know that sort of that's the process so that they can monitor throughout as they're reading. And then after reading, these are all essentially things that everyday people use to help remember any sort of thing. So after you read, summarize and paraphrase what you've read. Just saying it again reinforces that you've heard it twice now. Um, write it down, take notes, answer those questions at the end of chapters. They'll be useful for your comprehension then and they'll make a good study guide later on. So this moves us to the math part of it and we'll sort of go through this early number sense, math calculations, word problem solving, and these things came directly from this slide here. So we're going to walk through in sort of a developmental kind of a way. This is a slide that was in my presentation this morning. So starting with the early number sense and things that you can do to intervene around that. Now, as answering one of the questions this morning, there's not as much that we know about math, especially this early number sense and the empirically supported interventions. but. In thinking about sort of a ma the Matthew effect and avoiding the Matthew effect, exposing a child to math in a fun way with lots of reinforcers built in can be very, very helpful and reinforcing. Uh, so explicitly teaching some of those early number sense things that we know kids have trouble with. So teaching and reinforcing accurate counting that three is always three no matter what shape it or form it takes. Um, teaching, like I was mentioning with that one child, that you know, he, he needed to be taught about cardinality, that when you get to the end of counting, that tells you how many things there are. You can teach explicitly these things that maybe don't come automatically to every child. Um, practice with counting, since counting accuracy can be off. So anytime you have an opportunity, you know, look, I've got all this change, count how many coins I have. Um, starting off, too, with counting, I talked about this a little bit earlier on, that children will have an automatic string of numbers that makes up counting long before they understand what that means. So just counting as high as you can, counting to 10, counting to 20, counting as high as you can. Then counting objects is much easier than counting images on a page and sort of, sort of thinking developmentally in that way, what's most appropriate, what a child can be successful with and backing off a step if you need to um, and helping them practice in a way that's fun for them um, and, and not too challenging to be so frustrating. Um, comparing things, comparing number, comparing size, comparing which is heavier um, to get a sense of those sorts of things. And then just playing games that happen to have numbers embedded in them. So shoots and ladders, um, dominoes, candy land, games like war. Does everyone remember playing war? You know, two people put a number down, which one's bigger? Um, cards I particularly like because you get to see the number, what the number looks like, and you get a, a quick sense of how many that is because there are always seven spades on the seven cards or five hearts on the five card. Um, and also keeping an eye again on this functional numeracy, introducing number skills that have to do with money very early on. So sorting coins into the ones that look the same, um, naming coins, 
skip counting, so having a bunch of nickels, skip count by fives, a bunch of dimes, skip count by tens, to practice that that's how it really is applied in the real world. And then making small purchases. You know, if you can find the quarter, you can use it in the little vending machine in, in the front and get some trinket, gumball. I don't know what, what can you get for a quarter anymore. All right. So math calculations. Um, and remem remember that in math calculations, children with spine and bifida have a little bit of difficulty learning those number facts, learning them fluently, learning them efficiently, and they're sort of slower to acquire them. Eventually, they, they do catch up. Um, but there are interventions that specifically target these things. Um, things, again, here comes that word explicit instruction of these things, um, teaching them the rules that are always true. Um, so teaching them things like plus one, plus 10, if you add evens, um, things like that. Using manipulatives or pictures to help represent, this again goes into the, the things that are more, more concrete, will be more easily understood um, than if they're abstract and bringing a picture in can help that to be concrete. Um, and then doing timed practice and review of things. So these things are gonna sound very familiar in this next intervention. Um, Lynn and, and Doug Fuchs in that group um, made a lovely intervention that had specifically to do with math calculations. And they call it Math Flash. Um, and they start with this conceptual explicit instruction of what to do. So this strategy, they have rubrics that go through. First one is know it or count up. So children are taught this little title that goes with this little routine that they do. So either they know the math fact. If they don't, this is what you do. You put the biggest number in your head, you count up the smaller number on your fingers, your answer is the last number that you said. And that will always work for addition packs. It will always work. So you've given them a strategy that will always work for them. So we just talked about the conceptual and explicit instruction. They use multiple modalities. So you're doing a lot of practice with one skill, but it doesn't look that way. Because you're doing some on the computer, some with flashcards, some with a number line. So it looks different. Um, they end with a review of what they've done. And there's this motivation that's built in. So math facts, there are plenty of games that you can play with children or children can play by themselves that help to bolster math facts. Um, we talked a little bit about tricks that always work, um, you know, adding one, adding zero, multiplying by one, multiplying by zero. Um, does everyone know the nines trick on your fingers that if you nine times whatever and you fold down that, you know, say nine times six, this is going to work. Yeah, this way well. <laughs> nine times six, your answer should be 54. It always works for all nines. Now you never have to memorize a nine table because you always have 10 fingers. Um, wrap ups, those are the, the yellow things over there. Help you to, to do your math facts. Maybe we're all going to practice the nines. It really works, I promise. <laughs> Does anyone find it not working? Because we're going to count your fingers. <laughs> okay. Um, and the modified card game. So we talked a little bit about war. Everyone knows war. But you can practice your math facts that way. So now instead of everyone putting down one card, you put down two cards, you add them, and whoever has the largest sum gets to keep all four cards now. Or you multiply them, or you subtract them, whatever you're working on at a given time. So speaking of that, I know we've all just had a big lunch. So we're going to play some games. Um, so I like to use cards. And as I mentioned, you see the number, you see what quantity that number is associated with. So there are things you can practice like plus one. So we're all going to do this. This card plus one is? Three, ten, seven, seven, eight. Beautiful. And now we're going to do double. So this card double. Fourteen, twelve, eighteen, four. Oop, there should be one more. Whoop. Oh, no, I lost one. OK. Um, and now. This is a, an interesting strategy to make 10. So how much do you add to this card to make 10? You got it. And th this is a good skill to teach, it, you know, in a, addition to teaching addition. It also teaches sort of the precursor of carrying. So you're learning how many do you add before you end up with a two-digit number. So we already heard this one was eight. Hey, and that should be, oh, there's that one. 
Hey, all right. And so uh, I'm not the only one who thinks this is important. Lots of people think this is important. Um, in fact, um, Dr. Butterworth recently was interviewed on NPR and has this beautiful summary article um, in Nature. And there is a group that he's worked with in the UK that has come up with this beautiful computer game. Everyone can access it. It's on your, your handouts. And what it does is it, it allows you to practice. They call it number bonds. It allows you to practice these sorts of skills. I'm not sure how many games they have, but this one's fun, and it does the make 10. A number comes down, and you have to click on the number on the side that you would add to it to make 10. So as the numbers are coming down, it, the, they come down at a set rate, and you can physically see if that's going to work or not, if the two numbers you said add to make 10 are going to physically fit in that space. Um, another lovely thing that this does, it, it gives you sort of the visual that goes um, with the concept. Um, it has a rule that you, is a good one to learn. You get this practice of timed math facts, because the numbers are coming down at a steady rate. And as you get good at it, you move up the levels. Um, and so eventually, it looks like this. So you see just the numbers without the bars, and have to be accurate at doing that. So it's got lots of great components that make up a, a good math intervention. All right. So word problems. Um, word problem solving is an interesting thing. Um, there are a lot of components to, to word problems, and word problems in children with spina bifida we can expect to be particularly difficult because math is hard in a large number of children with spina bifida, and reading comprehension is hard in a large number of children with spina bifida, and so this is, hits both of those things. So there are some really nice empirically validated interventions that have been shown to work for remediating a math word problem solving difficulties. So this pirate math is by the Fuchs group, um, and they explicitly teach word problem solving skills while reviewing some of the foundational math skills as well. Um, there are multiple sessions, three per week, um, and they teach these efficient counting strategies, um, how to do calculations when there's more than one digit involved, how to identify what type of problem there are, and they divide word problems into four types and then solve those problems. Each problem has its own rubric, and then you check your work for accuracy. So, you start with a warm-up at the beginning, that's review of the math facts, the basic level of math. Then you end with a review of the new concept, so you make sure that to help with remembering that concept. Um, it also includes these lovely motivational factors. So there is a motivation built on achievement. So the more progress you make, you are graphing that progress and you get to physically, you get to see that in a, in a physical form. Um, you also get marks for your effort. So just by participating in an appropriate way. So if you think about those things I wanted you to think about to begin with, the um, functional numeracy, you're making graphs, you're making a meaningful graph with a child and that's one of the, the functional numeracy skills and Matthew Effect, they've got beautiful reinforcers here to help make the math fun. So here we go with the rubrics. Um, teaching them efficient counting strategies as part of pirate math, this should look very familiar. They're the people who did the math flash. Um, so this is their addition strategy. There's another rubric. Every time you see a math word problem, you're supposed to read the problem, underline the question, and name which of the four problem types we told you about it is and then you're just gonna practice sorting those things so that you can recognize this is that type of a problem, this is that type of problem. And then you learn a rubric for each type of problem that will always lead you to the right answer. And then at the end, this other rubric, looking for checking to make, the, make sure that your answer is correct. Uh, so does it make sense? It's sensible that if I started with 10 and took some away, I now have 12? That's not sensible. Um, did I line things up correctly? Did I do the calculations correctly? If I needed a label, do I have a label? Did I use the right sign? Did I accidentally add when I really should have subtracted? Okay. So that's one intervention. This is another intervention by another group. And I wanted to be sure to include this one because this has actually been looked at in children with spina bifida. Um, so this again goes through, has a series of rubrics. Um, essentially what they do is they condense these seven tasks have each of them have three components 
which would make it 21 tasks, and they condense them down to eight. Um, so you, you read the question, make sure it makes any sense to you. You paraphrase it so that you, it has personal meaning to you. You create this visual image of it so that you see what Sally had two dogs, her neighbor brought one dog, how many dogs are there now. Um, so you have an image of what that looks like. You estimate how much do you think your answer might be. Then you calculate it, and then you check. So this is very busy. This is in your slides, but I just wanted to sort of emphasize what parts go into each of these components. And you'll see that for every one of those tasks, you say what you need to do, you ask about if it makes sense, and then you check your answer. So you say, you ask, you check. You say, you ask, you check. And so children learn that strategy and applying it to each of these. That's that. So the exciting thing about this intervention is that it was looked at in a group of three teenagers with spina bifida, um, 15, 16, 17 year olds. And you can imagine if you're 15, 16, 17 years old, are math difficulties new to you? Have people probably tried to find things that help? Um, so this is a group that has a long standing history of math difficulties that has been resistant to whatever they've tried. And they did intervention for 10 weeks with exactly this, with the solve it, um, problem solving instruction. And then looked at their performance at the end of that intervention and followed up a month later. And what they found was that there was a between 47 and 64% increase in accuracy from the beginning of the instruction to the end of instruction. And that that accuracy was maintained a month out. Um, and so that's pretty impressive for a group who has struggled with math for so long. So, there's good news. <laughs> All right. Kind of getting toward the end, this math functional numeracy. Um, and realistically, the, this functional numeracy, and again, that's the using, um, telling time, making change, reading graphs and charts. That is what the best predictor of independence is as adults over and above reading um, numerous, or functional reading, rather. And so really, it's the holy grail of what you're looking for. So that's what you want them to, to be able to do. You want children with spina bifida or any other child to be able to successfully be functional with their math and reading skills. That's why we teach these things. That's why we send children to school. Um, so it's important to think about these things all the way through. So when you're thinking about these skills, take the money skills, for example, start very early with, you know, before kindergarten, preschool, having them sort coins, having them count pennies, having them name the coins, having them make judgments then later on, you know, grade school, middle school, do I have enough to buy this one thing I want to buy? What if I want to buy two things together? Do I have enough now? which is more expensive, which is less expensive, and using those real world experiences because that's really the setting where you need them to be successful with their academics. It's not in the classroom, it's in the real world as they're using those things. So to practice in those settings I think is really important. So we talked a lot about remediation, interventions, what you can do to help children who are struggling, but it's not the only answer. So. We teach the skills that we hope that children will learn, um, but not everyone can learn all these skills. But fear not, there's an app for that. There are many, many technological ways to help you with or get around things. So you see some here that might be useful, like an app to help you learn to tell time or math flashcards you can use on your iPod. Um, I don't think anyone cares how old they are in monkey years, but you could get an app for that too, um, all the way to, Apparently, Dr. Zabel would like that one. <laughs> All the way up to very practical things for adults that maybe a lot of us in this room might like to have, like a tip calculator. And it, I've heard stories of adults with spina bifida saying, you know, I really would love to go to dinner with my friends, but I won't because I'm embarrassed because I don't know at the end how much I need to pay for a tip. So I just won't go. And so if you can get an app that allows you to not only be successful with that math skill, but allows you to participate more in society in a typical way, then that's great, that's amazing. I think we're gonna hear a lot more about that in our next talk, actually. Maybe not particularly tipping, but technology. All right, so in summary, 
The important things to consider with any intervention are this idea of math, the Matthew effect. So to make the academic interventions fun, to help children not avoid getting the practice that they need that will help make those skills better. Um, knowing when to look for problems, when they will emerge. And so we talked a little bit, especially about reading with that, that typically kids have problems with reading in kindergarten, first grade. This population with spina bifida may very well not have problems then, but that doesn't mean they won't have reading problems. It might pop up around third grade when they're expected to do reading comprehension. That's something they're likely to struggle with. And so to look for that, not be surprised by that, and ask about that when children come. They're eight years old. You know, Sally was a great reading decoder. She learned reading really fast. How's her reading going now? To be sure to ask those appropriate questions at the appropriate times. And then providing this routine and structure, these things um, like using the rubrics to help scaffold, um, to decrease the load on executive functioning skills, working memory skills, and make those, um, the, the, to make things more automatic, to make them more associative, which are the sorts of skills that um, children with spina bifida are, are good at. And the final thing, the ultimate thing, is just to keep your eyes on the prize remembering that what you really want is that functional success, the functional literacy, the functional numeracy, and working toward those things in age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate ways as you go along throughout a child's lifespan. So that's all I've got. Questions? Um, so with intervention, I mean, the idea is that we want to have some kind of pre and post measure to know that it was successful. So what kind of recommendations do you have for these interventions? That's a good question. I think that a lot of the skills that we're teaching might not be as sensitive to the types of general measures that are available. Um, I think with a lot of the interventions, I'm thinking about the um, the math fact fluency intervention that the, the Fuchs et al. that group put together, the reading, the math comprehension, math problem solving interventions, the reading comprehension interventions. I think that there kind of are sort of pre test, post tests, and frequent assessment throughout those interventions as part of the intervention. Um, so I think that specific. It much, much in the same way that you're teaching specific tasks, you need to assess for gains in those specific tasks. Any others? How many years does a monkey live? You know, I haven't looked at this app, though I think you were going to pull up I won't get you. I will right. I won't. I won't get you buried in that hole. That's a good question. That's why I didn't put dog years because everyone knows how to calculate that, right? Yeah, there is an app for that too, though. <laughs> yes. Sure. There. So for a long while, it was thought that fast forward was a good intervention, um, and then it has become evident that it isn't as good of an intervention. Let me just, I think I have in my notes a good citation for that. Hold on just a sec. I can get you that citation for that. I certainly have that. Ah, it's Roos and Kruger, 2004. If you want more information, I can pull that up for you, too. It's, the problem isn't with the processing of the sounds. It's not an oral processing problem. It's the idea of understanding that the sound and the symbol go together, how those things go together, how they come apart, how they interact. That's the problem. And that intervention really looks at the sounds, what it does I haven't looked at it in a long while, is it plays the word at a very slow pace. 
And if you can process the word at a slower pace, then, you know, then it speeds it up, makes it into the word as we hear it typically. Um, and that you need to teach the skill that you want them to learn. So you don't need a child to be able to understand a word when it's read particularly slowly. You want them to be able to understand how to read the word. Um, I was wondering who's responsible for implementing these interventions. I don't see you. Where are you? I'm there. Okay. So that is a very good question. Um, there are, the schools are becoming savvy, especially with some of the reading interventions. Um, I know for a fact that the schools, some of the schools do include some of these reading interventions as their sort of tier two um, interventions. I know that the corrective reading program, I've heard a lot of parents and kids come back and say, today in corrective reading we worked on. Um, so there are some of these that are already implemented um, in an integral way in the schools and they're acknowledging that they're good interventions for kids who don't cut it in the regular curriculum. Um, the other interventions are a little bit newer. Um, they're very promising. Um, but I haven't heard as much of them being incorporated in the education program. Um, several of them are available to purchase. So if you had a family that could hire a tutor to work on things, some of them are not particularly expensive, like less than $100. Um, so there are, there are some that are available that a family could get someone to work with their child on them, and there are some things that the schools are integrating in. Thank you for attending this session. Because meeting your needs is important to us, we need your feedback on the presentation. Please take a few moments to complete our evaluation, which can be located by clicking on the presenter's name located to your left on the screen. It will only take a few clicks of your mouse to provide us information to make the SBU experience better for you and others. If you have any questions relating to SBU, please contact us at sbu at sbaa.org.